Thanks everyone for coming to take a seat today for our episode on film and television. So we'll dive straight in. Thanks. So first question, how, what has been your career path so far and how did you come to be in your current positions? Shall I start? Yeah. Um, well, my job now is um, I'm Executive Vice President Content at Screen Queensland. Um, and that's a job that basically looks after investment in projects and in people. So projects through development and production across all genres and all platforms and people through a whole range of initiatives which are designed to sort of build careers and give people opportunities to strengthen their skills. So I've got a team of about eight people um, and we're a very hardworking little group. Um, but I got into that role, I suppose, most recently, uh, having moved up to Brisbane from Melbourne where I was working at Screen Australia. And my job there was as a development executive, and that's um, something that I came to after having spent a decade in the UK working in development roles across factual TV drama um, and feature film drama. So um, I've been basically working on the industry side of things, so it's not just an international change, I suppose, to come out to Australia, but also a little bit of a shift in what I do from working on the industry side to working in government. Um, and prior to that decade, I'm not that old, but um, prior to that decade, I worked as a political journalist. So um, this is my second career, and that's, I guess, the broad brush strokes of how I came to be sitting in this chair. I love hearing origin stories <laughs> of people's back history. You must have been a political journalist when you were 12. It's well, we're trying to do the math there, then, and it's not adding up. Around then, yeah. So it's probably early bloomer. Early, clearly, it's a good thing. There's about two two major strands to my career path. The ones in industry, and the other ones in academia. Uh, the industry strand began uh, after I graduated from QT, film TV, and then went into screen distribution. So, in terms of film, it's a slightly unusual role. It's not behind the camera per se, and it's not in front of the camera either. It really is thinking about content and thinking about audiences and how those two things connect. So for six years I was in uh, acquisitions for Antidote Films, which is uh, a full service distributor based here in Brisbane. By full service there was a DVD label, we distributed theatrically, sold into all the other um, avenues that one would expect in terms of airlines and, and online, um, into TV. Uh, and from Antidote, I went freelance and did some consultancy work, largely in the, the online space for about another four years. So that was the distribution strand of my career. But while that was running, I had returned to university, did honours, PhD, began some teaching. Uh, and then for the last four to five years, I've been employed uh, as a lecturer at QUT, largely in film for many years, and now in my current role as a lecturer in creative industries at QUT. So there's the, the screen distribution, screen industry side, and there's the academic uh, lecturer side. But the wonderful thing about it, of course, is that the two have always kind of spoken to each other uh, and hopefully will continue to do so in that I'm able to now think about research and screen distribution and I can draw upon that distribution background um, in my research and teaching. Uh, so my background is a little bit similar to Rory's, um, so I was also um, a student, a former student of QUT and then I went on to do uh, my PhD there, um, which was looking at film festivals and particularly um, emerging uh, women filmmakers, so that was a great opportunity because I got to travel to um, some of the big festivals around the world like Rotterdam and Toronto um, and interview uh, filmmakers there about their careers. Um, and so since then I've done a lot more research and some work at film festivals, which I think is actually where we first met, isn't it, Rory? At BIF. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that was great. And um, I'm now working as lecturer in entertainment at QUT, but prior to that I was teaching film um, in Wellington, in Vict uh, sorry, yeah, Victoria University in Wellington at Griffith um, and JMC. Um, and so most of my research now is around film festivals. Um, and also still looking at uh, gender diversity and equality uh, in the film industry. So. Fantastic. Good on Jesus stories. But what do you think has changed most in the interest industry since you first entered it? Oh, wow. I mean, I think it's I think it's
it's really interesting. For me, I think a lot has changed and a lot is changing. Um, but so much more quickly, I think, in the past sort of five or so years than in the previous sort of 15, <laughs> if you know what I mean. I think that the tempo of change has been much, much faster. And the biggest thing, of course, is the numbers of different places that you can find screen stories. Um, not just Netflix, but all of the streaming services, but also YouTube, um, you know, people being able to make their own content and their own stories on screen and share it without any kind of permission to do so. Um, and I suppose that has been the biggest thing for me that I've seen as a change in our industry is just so, so, so many more different stories being told in so many more different places, which I think is probably the biggest thing that's happened in the industry to this point. Mm -hmm. So I'd agree with that, absolutely. It's the, you know, the, the barriers have been lowered so there's never more opportunity, not just opportunity, but actual content coming up from people like ourselves who, you know, may not have um, perceived themselves as the traditional kind of screen producers. So there's all this stuff coming up. Yet at the same time, from so many platforms, both globally uh, and nationally, there's so much high-level, professionally produced content uh, coming at us from all different sides. You know, you've got Netflix spending eight billion dollars a year on original content. So, and in the middle, of course, is us as an audience, spoiled for choice, but only with one set of eyeballs and one kind of attention that we can give at any given time. And the, the biggest challenge is literally how much great stuff there is and how we make choices as consumers about what to watch. That's a, it really is an attention economy. You know, We're paying with our attention. It's now a hugely valuable thing um, where we choose to, to put our eyeballs and put that focus. Um, and it's a lovely problem to have on one level, but gee, there's a lot yeah. of great stuff out there. And that competitive nature, I suppose, of how do you get viewers, how do you get people to come to your story? You know, linear viewing would kind of curate a program of um, TV for people to watch every night and sit down and everybody would come to the same show at nine o'clock mm -hmm. and that would be the thing that everybody was talking about the next day and now you've got to kind of find that same water cooler moment if you like or that same kind of moment for people to come together around a show but without really having the same kind of I suppose support mechanisms or frameworks or structures where people are pointing you to it and saying mm -hmm watch this, watch it at the same time, share thoughts about it, talk about it. And so I, I guess people who are making work now and are looking for how to get audiences to come to their stories now, having to cut through all of this other noise, all of this other great work and create those moments in really different ways. And I think that's a really interesting challenge, but also a really interesting opportunity. I think also um, tying into what you both just said is uh, social media is a big thing that's changed drastically and so it's great on the one hand in terms of it sort of can create those uh, I guess water cooler moments in an online sense but also because there's so much more content available now it adds to the noise around the, the amount of mm. content that we're um, accessing as well so for young filmmakers knowing how to negotiate social media and use that for their content is really important too yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah, absolutely right. And I, you know, when I think about social media and content creation, you know, you've got emerging forms like, you know, Punky's Bachelor recaps, which is like, you know, when you break down what those things actually are, they're so far from what we would have regarded as traditional filmmaking or content creation. They're bringing images and gifts and, you know, riffing off these previous bits of content, yet creating something that is really new and that lives and breathes in social media. And they get huge cut through, and they're hugely entertaining, and they're really, really funny. But where that sort of fits in with this idea of kind of content creation, it just becomes this other exciting new area. So you're right, social media has a huge part to play in all of this. Fantastic. You've all mentioned how people consume content is rapidly changing. How do you think uh, content, uh, sorry, content creators can adapt to this? I think it's really exciting, because I think that the one thing that it doesn't have to be anymore is general or broad. And I think that's the biggest thing, well, that's the biggest sort of takeaway for me about it, 
you can because you're not making a broad show for people in the sort of mainstream to watch in one country. You can make something that's kind of niche and kind of exciting and very, very distinct creatively that can speak to people in one country inside of that niche but also in lots of other places inside of that niche and because people can come to it in lots of different ways. I think you can actually be quite distinct, quite interesting, quite daring, quite bold about the content that you make mm. and the stories that you tell and the way that you tell them. And I think that that's really exciting. You know, so for, for me, as much as it's all, you know, that there is a lot of noise, there is a lot of competition, you do have to cut through. I think that it means that you don't have to be as generic and broad-based as perhaps you once did to win a big audience, and I think that that's kind of creatively very, very exciting. I think that it means, though, that for film, that for young content creators, they have to be really aware then of, of if they're going to make something niche and exciting, where they can find their audience then for that piece of content. Mm -hmm. um, that can be quite a challenge. But even just, um, I talk to my students a lot about uh, film festival strategies for their mm -hmm. graduate films and that kind of thing. And, um, uh, you know, there are so many thousands and thousands of film festivals in the world now, which is just one avenue of reaching an audience, but they can be as specific as a, a bicycle themed film festival mm. or, you know, and really, really kind of niche like that, which is really exciting, but makes it um, challenging as well in terms of where you can actually put your content to find an audience, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I still think the central challenge is the same. You have to mm -hmm. take what's meaningful to you and make it meaningful to an audience. Yeah. I mean, I think that will probably never change. Mm -hmm in some ways, the ways we do it change, the kinds of stories that we tell might change, but that fundamental, mm -hmm. I think, is still there, that connection that you mm -hmm. have to make. Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing that has changed and really accelerated probably again in the past five years, especially if we think about home viewing, is the kind of rate of second screen use. And by that I simply mean people will be watching a large screen, but inevitably they often have or constantly have a tablet or their phone with them. And that may or may not be linked to what they're seeing, but often it's not. We just sort of seem to be quite comfortable dividing our attention between Instagram and watching whatever's on the largest screen. And that, I think, is a real challenge for content creators, knowing about the fact that often people are not going to have purely undivided attention on what they're watching. And that's why I think film festivals are actually increasingly becoming important as one of the few spaces where hopefully you can almost guarantee that people are going to be sitting down and having that continuous, unadulterated, put the phone away connection with the work for 90 minutes for two hours. I think our opportunities to do that aren't growing. I think they're reducing in a really big way. And where are the spaces where that space, where are the spaces where that connection is best preserved? I think it's film festivals. Do you think? Yeah, I think so. But then I think um, also people are aware of um, you know, shows that they might, particularly with television, I think, that they might have on um, as a, you know, just a form of pure entertainment, relaxing at the end of the day, and then other shows or films that they really engage with um, on, a, on a deeper level or that require a much more intense um, amount of engagement. But yeah, absolutely, I think. And you're hoping that they're putting away the phones and the tablets well, for yeah. all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully, but whether that happens. But that shared experience of the lights go down. Mm -hmm everybody's turned their phones off and you're sharing that story and the filmmaker has got the opportunity to kind of reach out and grab a whole bunch of people who are sitting together in the dark. Mm. That is probably probably happening more often at film festivals um, than it is um, in the cinema. Certainly for particular types of films, I think, you know, let's not make any mistake about it, Billions of people are still going to the cinema all over the world. Millions of people are still going to the cinema in Australia. It's an incredibly healthy industry in terms of the amount of money that it makes, even here, where there's been something of a decline in recent years as in terms of the numbers of people going to the cinema. It's just that they're going to watch particular things. Mm -hmm. They're going to watch the kind of the big blockbuster films and films that demand to be seen on that big screen. And that's what's being shared in there. But for, I suppose, a more intimate, um, interesting kind of, you know, those films that are made for that niche audience at a festival, 
you know, that is probably the only place for them now because they're not playing on general release mm. in the cinema and that's kind of interesting too. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's great that those festivals are there and they're still sort of popping up all over the mm. place so that people can see that sort of more, I suppose, intimate work yeah. rather than the kind of the big, bold, kind of mainstream uh, blockbuster. And I think, you know, sometimes I think people are a bit think that people are, like us maybe, romanticise this aspect of, of the cinema or the feeling or the effect of cinema. But it's a real practical thing. And what I mean by that is one of the greatest things about being a, a distributor was that you'd have a connection with the work early, you'd watch something, you'd contact the filmmaker, you'd convince them to let you find audiences for Australia, you'd share it with the office, everyone would enjoy it. But then when you actually got it to a theatrical release and you sat in a cinema with people, they laughed at places you never would have thought, they cried in places you never would have thought. And that, that consensual, that group experience uh, was so much bigger than the sum of its parts. It's not a kind of, you know, this nice touchy-feely idea of everyone sitting together in a cinema. It's a real thing. Like, people just behave differently. They enjoy it differently. They're moved in different ways. Um, and I know we all kind of pay lip service to that, but it's a, it's a really vital, powerful thing. And I don't, as you say, Joe, it's very healthy, and I don't see that going anywhere. No. I'm actually working on a research project at the moment where we're looking at how many um, regional and local film festivals there are across Queensland. And we found about 90 film festivals yeah. in Queensland, which is, it's so amazing, really, that we have. And it's wonderful because it shows that there is still that real uh, need for that engagement. Mm. Yeah. And being with an audience and um, having visibility for the film yeah. industry. And, and people yeah. want to share things with their community, with their mm. friends locally. And, you know, it's not just yeah. about those big festivals that you have to travel interstate mm. or internationally to go to. You know, it's about sharing those things with the people that live next door to you. Mm. Often in a field or a kind of, you know, community space, which, is, which is lovely. Yeah. yeah. And then just the only other thing that Joe said which kind of tweaked my mind was um, you know, that idea of niche audiences and being able to find niche audiences. It's so true and across my desk today came a link to a YouTube series called Pasta Nonnas, which is nonnas, <laughs> grannies, making pasta. Uh, and you can only imagine how delicious and engaging and incredible, and all these women are amazing, they're just fantastic, you just want to throw them and hug them and then eat their pasta. And you, I just, you know, I'm not, I don't know if I'm the logical audience for that, but gee, it was good. And it's so niche. Like, that's so small on one level, yet so global on another level when you think about the fact that we've all got to feed ourselves at some stage today. It wouldn't be great to be inspired by some lovely old nonna who's literally spent her life making otaketi, you know? It's just, so that's just one small example of many that we could look at of um, niche content really just being amazingly powerful and delicious. <laughs> You've touched on um, festivals for sure. Um, one of the questions is, with the rise of boutique festivals and more shifting away from the uh, sort of conglomerates of uh, international film festivals, what benefits do you see for the industry in that? Especially, if, I know Tess, you have done research with women, uh, impacts for rising women in um, festivals. What sort of impacts and positive plays do you see for the industry in that regard? In terms of the, sorry, the ongoing impact of festivals. Yeah, so uh, sort of rather than uh, like the Brisbane International Film Festival, we have uh, small film festivals like Noosa Film Festival and things like that up and down the coast. Mm -hmm. So more about how, what positive impact do you see with the growth of these sort of niche festivals? Um, well, I think it's about giving people the opportunity to come together with their community in areas outside of Brisbane, that's really important. Um, it's an opportunity for filmmakers to see their film in front of an audience too. Um, that's something that's really valuable, I think, um, as Rory was saying, to see an audience's reaction. I know it's a really scary thing for filmmakers to see their film in front of an audience for the first time. Um, but so just having that visibility for the film industry, I think, is, is super important. Um, and yeah, a sense of film community. I mean, we've seen particularly with a festival like Biff, it goes through so many different mm -hmm. incarnations, um, particularly over the last sort of 10 years, but it remains because it's so important yeah. um, to our community, yeah. I think it's really important about in, in, the, in the sense of inspiring people as well. Mm -hmm. I think if you're a kid growing up in a small town, you've, you've got something to say. You've got a story. We've all got a story. And... I think that when you see 
<coughs> on the screen in your town, uh, the work of people who live not far away from you or better still come from where you come from and they might be sitting there in the audience and coming up on the stage at the end and doing a little bit of a Q&A and talking about how they got their work made or the, some of the thoughts and feelings and thinking that went into them creating their film. I think that for people who are sitting there thinking, oh, I'd, I'd really love to do this but I don't know if it's for me, I think it tells them that yeah, it is for you actually, you can do that and I think it's really important to keep inspiring that next generation of filmmakers to come forward, that next generation of storytellers, wherever they want to tell their stories, and they might not end up telling stories for cinema, they might end up telling stories in a completely different way. But I think that by having those kinds of shared experiences in your local community, it makes you understand that it's not about them, it's about you. Mm. And mm. I think that that's really important too. I couldn't agree more. I mean, Joe just talked about the, the opportunities for, for makers and creators and to get their work on, on screen. But the number of, of regional festivals in Queensland, I guess, really speaks to um, the everydayness of a, of a film festival. And I don't say that to detract from, from the experience, but film festivals and attending film festivals shouldn't be seen as this kind of elitist thing. It should be, you know, it's a film shot, but it's a festival. And it should be celebratory. It should be something that people can access and really engage in and it shouldn't have this kind of cultural vegetables idea where you kind of eat it and it's good for you. You know, it should be something that you're kind of like mm. barreling down the highway to get to because it's fun and it's enjoyable. And when people have those experiences, that festival experience with films, that celebratory experience with people that they like and want to have a drink with, that's, uh, that really underlines, I mean, screen culture. I mean, that's, that feeds into... Um, part of what is really, really vital about our cultural life, why we're here and what makes life worth living. You know, film festivals have a, a really significant role to play in that. And I don't think that's overstating it at all. I mean, I, I think that's really, really important. I don't Fantastic. Well, let's dive into the digital world. Uh, series now being developed across all sorts of different platforms, Netflix, Stan in Australia, and Tess, you mentioned Facebook, but you can do um, the New York series. What do you think this means for Australian industry? How can they utilise this growth? Well, I think that more platforms be means more opportunity. Um, and I think that for Australia, much like anywhere else that's not America, um, I think that there's a real opportunity to give that sort of very, very, very big, very hungry American market, stories that they can't get from their own culture and insights into worlds that they wouldn't otherwise be able to access, but ones that they can identify with and ones which resonate with them. And I think that that's always the kind of interesting challenge with streaming and with um, stories for global platforms is to have that courage. I think as a storyteller to make something that really is distinct and authentic to your culture um, and your experience and also speaks to audiences globally. Um, but when that's done well, I think that that's, a, you know, I think that's the real opportunity and that's how you can respond. So let America be America because they're really good at that. They are. Really good at it. And be Australian mm. and be proudly Australian mm. and be proud of every little distinct and different and diverse bit of Australia because I think, you know, there are lots of different Australias. I'm an outsider to Australia and I see it very much with outsiders' eyes even though I have an Australian passport, I'm an Australian citizen and I've lived here for six years. I think that I always still will be a little bit, well a lot, British. <laughs> and so, but I love that because I see Australia with outsiders mm -hmm. eyes and I'm excited by it. Mm -hmm. And what I would encourage Australian creators to do be, is to understand that the stories that you have and the people that you are and the culture that you represent is really interesting to other people who are not you. Yeah. Because it is. And I don't think it's just me. 
I think that there is a fascination about other people, other ideas, other cultures, but that speak to us as human beings um, and resonate with our own experience, but give us something that is just so extraordinary and so different from our own day-to-day -day lives. I think that that's, I think that's really powerful. And I think that that's where perhaps the cut through comes from, leaning into that. I think too, if you look at what's happened with other industries around the world, so if you look to say Wellington um, in New Zealand and what happened there um, with Lord of the Rings and, and you know, it's um, size wise, Wellington is a similar size to, to Brisbane um, and the kind of the tremendous growth in that film industry since um, the Lord of the Rings franchise and all of that infrastructure development has just been amazing for that film industry. Um, but going back to Joe, what you said about the fact that you know we don't need to be Hollywood, we can be something very distinctly Australian. Um, other international film industries, like Nollywood, for instance, does that too, don't they? With their, they have this very um, distinct, unique kind of film industry, um, and audiences there obviously still consume um, global and Hollywood product, but they have their own really clearly defined niche for what they do. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for Australia to continue growing in that direction. Um, and I think like with regard to platforms too, we've got lots of examples that have come out just this year. So films like um, The Second, with um, you know, which has the partnership with Stan obviously, but we've also had um, screenings in, in cinemas is a really great example of how it doesn't have to necessarily be either or. I think there can be opportunities on streaming and in cinemas as well. So, yeah. I have to say, I think Stan really has been demonstrating a very visible commitment to Australian stories and investing in those in partnership with Screen Queensland and others. Uh, it's great to see that identification of a, of a demand and an appetite for Australian screen stories. And look, it's a smart um, business decision as well because that content is advertised. And if there's only one place that the public know that they can go to for that, then that's a, a real driver to subscribe. I don't think we've seen Netflix do that to the same degree, but they're a very different company in some ways to Sam, a very different company, despite from a kind of you know surface public level just being another platform or another streaming provider. I mean, one I've been thinking about one piece of content in relation to some of these discussions, and that's uh, Ludo Studios Bluey, which was just released a couple of days ago, which is a, a series of kids about a family of blue healers living in Red Hill in Brisbane, uh, and that Brisbane feel is just all around. I mean, it's just a beautiful little story and beautiful um, animation, but that's you know something made in Brisbane, uh, with Brisbane with Australian voices that's gonna be distributed to the world through BBC Worldwide. And reading a, an article about it, uh, where the makers were discussing the fact that they really hope that for the, in, the inevitable US audiences that will see it, they really hope that those Australian voices aren't changed, that those accents aren't changed. And to Joe's point, I, I hope that's correct. I hope there's a real appetite in the US to see something that's really quality, but very distinct and of a place. You know, you couldn't get a more Brisbane show in some ways, despite the fact that it's a family of animated dogs. You know, it's really a Brisbane story in, in a huge way. And I'd love to think that those, um, those voices and those accents will remain, uh, because I think now, as you say, there's a, a genuine appetite for it. We don't want everything just turned around. Uh, so I, I hope that, that um, series will go from strength to strength. I'm sure it will. Fantastic. Well, in such a globalised landscape, how does Australian production stay relevant to compete like, with titans like America? I'm going to push back a little bit on that, on that question in that I think one of the things that, that's emerging now is that you, you mentioned compete. And, and I guess the question that's worth posing back is do they need to compete? I mean, what does competition look like in a globalised world? And I think that's relevant for, for emerging practitioners because what is, what is success really going to look like? I mean, if you've got those thousand true fans that are supporting you to have a career and make your work, do you need to be competing with anyone? I mean, is that actually success as you define it? I mean, when we look at the numbers, I mean, we don't even know what the Netflix numbers are. So that's a good example. Netflix uh, will only kind of give a nod across the boardroom table and a thumbs up in terms of how shows are going. They don't release those numbers. So we know that they're being invested in, we know that they're being seen, but in terms of that metric of success that we apply to other things where box office results, for instance, uh, it's really hard to assess success mm -hmm. in terms of Netflix. We know they invest. They have changed, actually, the, defini the definition of success. Mm. 
full screen content because we've always assessed success as how many viewers did it get, what were its overnights if it was a TV show, or if it was in the cinema, what was its box office? And those metrics were always the things that said, that's successful, that's not successful. Mm. You know, with obviously some of the critical acclaim, um, and you know, if something is award nominated or award winning, um, with that sort of sliding scale of the prestige of the awards that is being nominated for or receiving. Um, but those were really the kind of major metrics. Was something being watched? Was something um, doing good box office? And was it winning awards? And that's really changed too. So success, I think, and our ability to determine what is successful has become a little bit looser. So I, I agree with what you're saying, that you know, looking at success and looking at competition is a slightly different conundrum. Um, I think perhaps than it once was. Mm -hmm. um, and I also believe that when you've got that sort of extension, um, that increase of work being made, um, the numbers of stories being made, the numbers of hours of drama, the numbers of films that are being made has increased exponentially because of the introduction of the streaming services. And in a way, yes, it's brought competition, but it's also brought huge opportunity. And I think that you've just kind of got to look at both of those things. You know, sometimes um, when there's a lot of work out there, yes, you do have to work that little bit harder to get your audience to come to it, to get it seen. But on the flip side of that, when you're actually trying to put work out there into the market, there are more opportunities and there are more places mm -hmm. that you can do it. So I think there's, it, I think it's a slightly more complex mm -hmm. landscape than it used to be because of that. And I think that for me, if you focus on opportunities um, rather than barriers or difficulties, that's probably the better way of going about it. Um, and I think it will probably serve you well, actually, to sort of look for the opportunities. Yeah. I mean, one measure of success, obviously, is that you get to make more work. Mm -hmm. If you have that opportunity uh, and if you have the resources, whether that be your own or from other people, to be able to make more work and continue to have this job, that's a massive success. Um, but again, just to bring festivals into it, like, uh, again, that, that marker of success for some filmmakers, having one or two births at, at top tier uh, festivals is success. You know, you look at what are the numbers of audiences that would have seen that, well, they're in relative terms, they're tiny. But that curation and that recognition and that prestige that would come with the festival birth uh, is enough for some filmmakers to feel absolutely that they're successful. Do you think that's fair yeah, to say? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So when I talk to um, a lot of my students about a strategy for their graduate films, certainly um, aiming for some of the top tier festivals is one of them, but also just to think about what they would define as success for their work. So it could be festival laurels, obviously, are always um, mm -hmm. fantastic to have, but um, it, it, it could also be that um, festival strategy isn't right fit for their film and they end up putting it online and getting an audience that way. Um, so, yeah, I think there's lots of different ways to define success. It's also about, you know, what kind of impact you want your film to have in documentary as well. It can be about getting, you know, the message of the film out there to an audience. Um, but always, yeah, for, particularly for emerging filmmakers, getting opportunities to go on and then create the next piece of work is really crucial. And so, you know, giving yourself a time limit for exhibiting that, that first piece of work is really important as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, considering this, uh, we'll go behind this camera at this stage. Considering the sprawling nature of the production, how do you adapt to new sets and new people? In terms of new people, um, I've recently been involved in bringing in a series of industry guests to a unit uh, called Screen Issues at QUT. So that's industry guests that come in and, and speak about their experience and, and what third year students at QUT are, are likely to be encountering. Uh, and one of the several themes that came through on the people front, and this is not unique to the film industry, but it is a people industry, it is a relationship industry um, in a big way. And being, and that's not about being like a crazy networker or anything, but that is about being a, an honest and authentic communicator. You do need to make a real genuine and concerted effort to connect with people 
to stay in contact with those people and to work well with people. So to your question, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. I mean, whether that be on the production side or in any aspect of the of it, being able to work well with people and your, I suppose, reputation as being someone who can work well with people is actually really important. I mean, I've heard it you know, described up to 80% of this job is about people. It's about actually the relationships you have, the connections you have, uh, and being able to, I don't want to say leverage, it's not a, but work effectively with people. It's a huge thing. Well, most jobs that you get, whether they're executive jobs or whether they're crew jobs or whatever they are really, I think in this industry, and it's probably not um, isolated to this industry, but it's very, it, it, is, it is very much part of this industry, they're word of mouth recommendations. So people, I think you're right. I think your reputation is really one of the most important things that you have. Um, and in terms of adapting to people on sets and working in physical production, and it's just the same as anywhere, I think. It's just, you know, be respectful to other people. Um, be respectful of who they are and be respectful of what they have to do to make the project happen. Um, be on time. Yeah. Be polite. Um, you know, don't be a dick. <laughs> it's. I, I just think that's, you make it sound so easy, yet so many people struggle. With it at the same time. <laughs> but you know what I mean. I think it's just those normal human things. Yeah. Just be a good person yeah. and be good at your job and work hard, mm. um, and you, you're probably pretty likely to do well. And that will actually you know, cut across any changes yeah, to sets yeah. or people. That will maintain you in any career effect. Mm. I know. Yeah. Um, there's often a bit of a mis misconception too that you have to be an extrovert to be good at, mm. at networking or uh, can, you know can, connecting with other people. But if you um, just go in there and be genuine and mm. don't go in with an agenda too, I think you know there's so much you can learn from people that you work with, um, even if they're in very different areas to you. So yeah, going in and being genuine and um, just seeing what you can learn from the experience and working hard, yeah, it's yeah. really important. I think say yes to more things than you say no to. <laughs> um, I mean, that's not that you should say yes to everything, that could be dangerous. Um, but just being up for it, I think, that's one of the things that you can do, I think, to adapt to um, these changes, because I think that probably the subtext or one of the subtexts of your question is that you're asking us to talk about whether these changes mean that you have to work differently. And I think that yes, you do to an extent, you have to be adaptable. Um, I mean, you always did have to be adaptable to a certain point, but you do have to work across a range of disciplines, you do have to be open to different ways of doing things, new ideas. But I think if you can hold on to those fundamentals of being a good human being who's hardworking and good at what they do, mm. and just understand that, yeah, having that open mind and that flexibility and that hunger to learn new things, mm -hmm. I think that stands you in really good stead too. I will mention one potential change about sets and, and production that, that may be coming down the pike, and, and it's linked to the influence and the production that, that large digital providers in Silicon Valley effectively is going to have to play. So when, when players like Facebook and, and Google that have come from uh, an industry that, that's big on efficiency, that's hugely involved in making sure that things run well and effectively, when they look at how film sets and production schedules are run now, from their perspective they're seeing a lot of waste and a lot of inefficiency and a lot of duplication and a lot of people doing one role when they could be doing several. Now, part of the reason that that remains is that that's the way it's been done for a long time, and it's bound up in so much creativity and so much business at the same time. But there's another perspective that's coming through from some of these online players, and if they had their way around some production sets, and they have the pockets to have their way around some production sets, we might see those models and the ways of working changing in a really big way, and it's going to be driven by one thing, and that thing is efficiency and it will be about creating content faster and getting it to market quicker. Now the question mark around that is, well what happens to the quality of that content and the creativity along the way? That's a really interesting question that they'll have to deal with. 
but it's an interesting perspective to think about in terms of production, which is that when you have outside players who come from a very, very different um, technology model and they look at what we're doing in terms of film, they see a lot of creativity, but also a lot of potential waste and inefficiency. And I think that's a really interesting um, dynamic. Fantastic insights there. But um, what strategies do you think you can divulge or give insight into with in respects to going from a, a student creator to a full-time creator in the, in the industry? Um, I would suggest just being visible as much as possible. So, um, you know, with, uh, going to as many industry events as you can. Um, there's lots of stuff coming up this week, actually, with BIF starting on, um, on Thursday, and then we have um, the, a whole lot of events that, that students could be going to. Um, just to kind of get a feel for what the industry is like and who the key people are, um, I think is really important. Um, and then, yeah, as Joe was saying before, saying yes to as many opportunities as you can and thinking broadly about content production as well, potentially, rather than just thinking, I really want to work in feature films and only trying to pursue opportunities in that area, getting a broad range of experience because you don't know what that might lead to. Mm -hmm. I think the good news for emerging practitioners and those coming out of uni is that the people that are going to get them employed and get them work are actually around them as they exit. And they're around them that when they left a year or so ago. The people that will be able to connect uh, graduates within film schools and universities are not only their peers but the people that have literally just left. So maintaining those contacts and getting those people to be able to clue you in to certain things that are happening um, is not only easy because you know those people, but it's actually what is going to ensure that you have some work. So that's one thing, we see that time and time again. It's not, you know, some executive that you hope to meet at SPA, it's actually the people that you study with and who've just left. Um, so that's one thing, I mean, of course turning up uh, is just, you know, turning up two things, being visible, as Tess said, like it sounds so simple, yet it's so hard, because of course you need to organise your life, all the other bowls that you have that you're juggling, you need to be able to organise to be able to turn up to that event. You know, it's easy to say and it's hard to do. And look, uh, this isn't just from a, a Queensland perspective, I'd say this from anyone in any state and territory in Australia because we're lucky to have this support. I'd say this if Joe wasn't here, but getting involved with what Screen Queensland does and even simple th stuff like signing up to a newsletter to be able to clue you into what's happening is really, really vital. There's so much... Um, intellectual labour that you should be doing around keeping abreast of funding opportunities, keeping across what's happening with festivals, keeping across what Netflix or Stan might be commissioning, so that when you have that opportunity to connect with people, you can have, uh, as Tess suggested, just an authentic, genuine conversation. Because this is the stuff you're interested in, right? This is the, the career that you want to have. So like delve into it and just like feed yourself as much as possible with, that you can with this information. I'd say it's really, um, really important to do. I think that's right. I think knowing what's going on in your industry is just a really, it's a straightforward first step. I don't say that it's an easy first step because obviously there's a heck of a lot of work that you have to do inside of that. But it's a fairly straightforward thing to do to get yourself informed about what's going on. And I think to actually understand what's going on near you. Because I think sometimes when people go into a new career in a particular place, they think, oh, God, I've got to go here. You know, I've got to go to Los Angeles or I've got to go to Sydney mm. or whatever it is, whatever the sort of scope of your ambitions are. You know, you might have it in your mind that you have to go somewhere else. Um, but Rory's right, the networks that you have and the kind of peer equity that you have around your own student life and your, um, I guess, your, the early days of your postgraduate life is really, really valuable. And I think don't underestimate that. Um, there are lots of things going on. Um, there are lots of opportunities. Um, not everybody will get a funding opportunity straight off the bat. But that doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't keep engaging with screen agencies or um, people who are decision makers either within them or within networks. It takes a little bit of time, I think, to get to that point where you are being funded um, and you are kind of getting formal support to do what you do. 
Um, but there's lots of informal support. I mean, I meet lots and lots of people who are just about to graduate or graduated or have just recently graduated. And I do that um, very deliberately. Um, not because I think that I owe those graduates something, but because I think that it would be very foolish of me to work in our industry and do my job and not know the hot new talent that's coming out into the industry. And I think, you know, hold on to that because actually all of these people who were talking about the Netflix, the Stans, the Screen Queenslands, the Screen Australias, whoever they are, the ABC, they're all looking for the next best thing and the next exciting thing. And I think, you know, just valuing that. Um, doing other jobs too, mm. you know, other jobs inside of the industry so that you keep your practice. Mm. Um, you know, I really, really believe that directors direct, writers write, producers produce. Um, but that's not to say that you can't also learn mm. from doing things in other parts of the industry. Some people get phenomenal opportunities and build phenomenal careers from you know, working crew jobs and kind of building up their experience by doing something that isn't necessarily the thing that they want to do and the label that they want to have. You can twin track a sort of, I guess, a money-making career, um, doing things that are relevant in your industry and building up skills that might not be exactly what you want to do with um, a sort of labor of love career where you sit at home at nights actually working on your passion project and I think we've all done those things but the thing about um, the thing I wanted to really say was don't underestimate the power of the thing you think you're only doing for money yeah. because the thing you think you're only doing for money might actually be the place where you get your real opportunity and your real break um, in, inside of the world that you sort of, your heart says that you want to be in. And it might surprise you mm. that by doing those jobs that appear to be um, not squarely where you think you want to be, mm. they might actually be the things that actually open the, fight, the, the door to what you do want to do or open the door to another passion that you didn't even know that you had. Um, but I was... But, in terms of those passions, if you are a writer, if you are a creator, you know, if you are writing, keep writing, you know, and keep sharing your work, um, keep reading, uh, look at lot, look at the novels that are out there, the um, factual books that are out there, look at the magazine articles that are out there, find stories to tell, find things that are already resonating with people and think about how you might sort of use those stories. You know, find stories that the world wants to hear or has already signaled that they are interested in and have an appetite for. You know, if you're a director, keep directing. Find lots of different ways of directing. Do music videos, do um, corporate videos, do whatever it is um, to actually just keep your practice and keep your craft growing all the time. Um, I just believe that if you are um, a creator that really all you have is your practice and you just got to keep doing it no matter what's going on in all the other bits of your life but don't, as I say, underestimate those other bits might actually be the thing that sort of, funnily enough, unlocks the door for you. No one seems to want to be a production accountant. You know, when we ask students, no, in, the first, when we ask students in the first year, you know, who wants to be a producer, a forest of hands shoot up, but no one wants to be a production accountant. Yet I'll tell you now, a production accountant is a, a, a lucrative and a very highly sought after uh, role, not only in Australia, but internationally as well. And the one production accountant I, knew, I know didn't always want to be a production accountant, although he was good at it, but now he's a successful emerging producer because the years he spent as a production accountant not only kept him in the industry, but exposed him to a whole host of people within industry who he's now producing with. So Joe's point around that line between the things you're doing for money and your creativity don't have to be entirely divorced. They can absolutely speak to each other. Um, so and also, we have a shortage of production accountants not just in Queensland, but in Australia. Um, and there are shortages of various other roles. Um, the, you know, there's a shortage of first ADs. Mm. 
all around the country. Um, that means you can get a job and start making contacts and start being somebody that people are aware of and who, um, to your point, be visible. Um, that's how you can be visible. So, yeah, I think that's really interesting. Fantastic. Well, we'll take a uh, local uh, focus for uh, the next question. What do you think the challenges to overcome in the local industry is for people entering uh, the industry in Brisbane or in Queensland? I think they're no different than they are for anybody anywhere else. Um, if anything, I think you're in quite a good position here. Um, the population is smaller. Um, the level of support is pretty high. Um, the opportunities are here. Um, and I think that you can make and grow a really successful career here. Um, that's not to say it's without challenges, but I don't think that this conversation that we're having here would be that much different if we were having it in Melbourne or if we were having it in Sydney. Um, it would be different if we were having it in America because there wouldn't be any sort of formal support for no. careers or for career development or for your work. You just have to go out and do it. And I kind of think that that's something to keep in mind that it sometimes feels as though things are harder because you're here, but if you can turn that on your head in your thinking, um, actually it might be that it's not. Mm. And something I do think that's maybe not unique but specific to the Australian context, and perhaps Joe's noticed this but perhaps not, is that we're very democratic in Australia. And what I mean by that is if you really want to speak to someone who's in power in the Australian screen industry, if you go to the right festival and you're not a dick, you can speak to that person very easily. Like, we're accessible and democratic in the way that we structure things. And the idea that pretty much anyone in the Australian screen industry may be approached at a festival and be obliged or have some engagement is pretty reasonable. Like, that's not true in the States. That's not even true in the UK as much. It's much more hierarchical and much more power-led. That's a really good thing for emerging practitioners here in Australia. That's true of Queensland, but it's also true in um, New South Wales and Victoria as well. So it's a lot easier for people who want to connect with people to do so if they're appropriate and authentic and if they do so in a meaningful and sensitive way. So that's perhaps an advantage that uh, emerging practitioners might not be aware of, but it's a real thing and it's an Australian thing, which is good. Yeah, and I think I would support what Joe said as well. And just um, I think that there still is a bit of a sense, I don't know what you've seen with your students, Rory, but that uh, this idea that you know, you need to leave Brisbane to get work in the film industry, that you need to go to Melbourne or Sydney, and I would implore you not to do that. Um, I think there's lots of exciting opportunities in Brisbane, and um, and even just a sense sometimes too amongst my students that I've talked to that they can be a bit dismissive of Australian content, that it's, it's you know, not for them, or, that, you know, um, they don't find it as interesting, but I would say, you know, that, that you need to, you are already part of the Australian film industry as you graduate, and you need to, you know, find as many opportunities as you can to support that because you're already part of it. Um, so, yeah, look for the opportunities here would be the biggest thing. And I think if you think you're great, find three other people who you also think are great, who want to do, who have share, share your ambitions and kind of share a creative vibe, um, but maybe have different skills. Because if you can find a group of four people, I think you can make anything. And, you know, it comes back to my point of practice and keeping working. Um, I think if four students from QUT who graduated put their minds to it, I'm pretty sure that they could make and market a world-beating short film, web series, micro-budget feature or something that if they get a little bit of fair wind mm -hmm. could set the world on fire. Why not? Why not indeed? It's never been easier to do it than now. <laughs> well, final quick question. If you could share one piece of advice or hard truth for creatives going into the industry, what would it be? Well, I'm sorely tempted to steal Joe's line about don't be a dick. I mean, that's like, <laughs> you know... Although slightly profane, it's, you know, absolutely, it's a point like, 
just try to be uh, try to be sensitive and respectful to people and try to be understanding not just to what you want out of an engagement or out of a project but to what the bigger picture is and what everyone's looking um, to do and then the only other thing I'd say and this is a really tricky thing and, and as academics we see this all the time with, with marking marking student assessment is that you've got to be able to separate out feedback which you might interpret as criticism from creative work and you've got to be able to see the creative work as sitting as itself and although it came from you that when that work is being fed back on or and you may interpret that as criticism that it's not a direct criticism of you as a person or your creative output that it's actually about this thing that you've created that needs to have feedback placed upon it and needs to be changed and shaped by other creatives in the world. That's a hard thing for a lot of people to do. But it's a really important thing, I think, to be able to get your head around that you need to be able to understand that feedback will come. Some of that you won't, you won't like, but you can't embody that and take that personally. Yeah. I think that's really good advice. I guess it comes down to remembering that you're working in a collaborative industry and that it's not just you. Um, but I did write down a few thoughts in, because I did want to try and give some advice. I didn't give advice. You did <laughs> give advice. You did give advice, sorry. I'm not saying you didn't give advice. I'm just saying, you know, I feel funny about being asked for advice. You take it very seriously. I do. As you should. And, and I wanted to just make sure that I said what I wanted to say. So, um, I think you should believe in yourself. That's one piece of advice. And I think that you should then make a plan. I think planning is really good. <laughs> um, when you've made the plan, I think you should be prepared to throw the plan out of the window if a really, really great opportunity comes in that's not part of your plan. Um, I think you should find great people to work with. Um, I think you should say yes more often than you say no. And I think that you should run your own race because at the end of the day, it's not really about what everybody else is doing. And some people are going to get opportunities that you might have liked or get a break that you would have given your left arm for. And it's going to happen. Um, but you're in your own race and you will get there um, and it might be that some of the things that you think of as setbacks will be the things that you say thank you for in retrospect um, so that if you can just keep your eyes on your own lane and your own tape at the end of the finish line I think that that's probably not a bad thing to do that was my bit of advice um, I think mine was pretty straightforward and it ties in really well with what Joe said about running your own race. I think that's a great, great piece of advice. Um, I think what I've noticed, not just in my own career and people that I work with, but with creatives in general, is that if you are persistent and you're resilient, um, you will be successful. Um, yeah, persistent. persistence persistent and resilience. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And we've touched on this a couple of times, but you know. In all honesty, there's never been a better time to be an emerging practitioner in screen media in Queensland than right now. Honestly, I'm not, you know, it's, there's more opportunities, the barriers of entry are lower, there's more emerging creative people to connect with. I honestly, I hope my worthy panelists agree with me, but I honestly feel like there's never been a more promising time to make creative work and forge a career out of it. Please I, not, please not oh, curious. Look. I haven't got um, that, I've, I've lived here for just over four years, so I haven't really got that much of a sort of um, ability to make a kind of comparison or to uh, draw back into uh, the past and what's happened. But what I can say is I feel really excited about being here and working here, and I wouldn't be here. I'm not here because I have to be here. I'm here because I want to be here and I'm here because I think it's a really exciting time to make work in Queensland and to be part of the Queensland screen industry and if I was coming out of uni right now I would be really excited about it and I would feel like right this is my time this feels great and I genuinely mean that and so yes I do agree but without the ability to have that context. <laughs>
I do too. That's yeah. That's all I have to say. I agree. We're all furious <laughs> agree. We are. So what a fantastic sentiment to end on. Thank you, Tess, Rory, and Joe, for joining us on Take a Seat on this week's episode of Film and Television. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank you. Us. Cheers. Don't you want to Thoughts on vision.